Michael Ox is representing Cologne. Uh, it's this year my only guy from Cologne. Oh, I am sad that uh, Max uh, from Boeing couldn't make it because he's still in San Francisco. Um, so he preferred to San Francisco to Cologne. Oh, can we have a big boo? Like, oh. <laughs> so I'm sure he's coming the next year. Um, <laughs> and uh, when I change the name again of the conference to Taylor Swift Cologne. Um, and uh, so um, we actually, it's, it's, it's really hard to remember where we know each other. Uh, uh, me and Michael, probably some random dub dub in 2012 or before, we don't really know, but we uh, found each other. What, uh, what sticks to my mind uh, about him is that I've seen him a lot of time at a common place of ours, which is Coco, Coco Heads. Whether it would be uh, uh, in, in, in Aachen or in Cologne here, uh, um, we uh, eat giving a lot of talks, which is really good, good because he is doing a lot for the community. Um, the, the way I, I've seen him uh, the last uh, times, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to have him, is that I see him as kind of a watchOS uh, 1.0 warrior, or watchOS warrior uh, in, in general. Uh, oh yeah, that's, uh, anyway. All right, the two are coming together, whatever. Uh, because um, after the dub dub this year, he told he, uh, when we s we were saying like watchOS 2 is nice, and so uh, nobody should do uh, an app in watchOS 1. He said, yeah, that's why we already did it. Uh, thank you, Apple, for that. <laughs> but still, he, he got kind of the privilege to work with watchOS 1. <laughs> and now he also gets the privilege to talk, to speak French with me. So here's the thing, he doesn't speak any French. Um, but, I'd <laughs> but at DubDub, I have this thing, and, and Andre Andreas actually could attest the same thing. I actually, I entered his uh, hotel room when we were at DubDub, and I apparently I spoke French with him, uh, but I didn't even realize, because at DubDub, uh, which is this kind of the same here, I get with my French people and my German people and my English people, and after like two or three days, I get totally messed up, and I start speaking French with the Germans, and Germans went to French. So, uh, but anyway, I am super glad that he is here, and uh, let's welcome everybody, uh, Michael Ox. About um, Time Matters, a watch kit story. Um, so yeah, we were one of the um, uh, companies that Apple basically screwed by um, telling us that it's very cool to do a watch app uh, for watchOS 1, um, which it actually was, but then with watchOS 2, it's not so cool anymore to have a watchOS 1 app because a lot, of, a lot of stuff is different there. Um, anyway, I'm, um, uh, yeah, I'm working at HRS, the Hotel Reservation Service. Um, uh, hopefully, some of you, or the best thing would be all of you, um, know this company. We are basically selling hotel rooms. And um, we do have a strong focus on business travel. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we, of course, we sell rooms to everybody who wants to get a hotel room, but. Uh, really, the main, our main customers are big companies that book like uh, a couple of hundred rooms or um, something like that. Um, we did have an Apple Watch app um, in the store on um, the launch day, which basically was a goal that um, some of the um, iOS developers um, stick themselves. So um, it really was an engineering-driven uh, thing that we wanted to be on the watch uh, on the first day. Um, so it was basically developed by two um, iOS engineers uh, from our team. Um, the one was me and then uh, also a colleague of me and we also did a lot of the conceptual work um, that, should, that, that we took there. Um, so um, yeah, iOS developers can do conceptual work too, that's what we uh, find out there. Um, it worked, actually I think it worked pretty well, uh, we definitely did need a designer at some point. Um, but um, yeah, um, we also wanted to do something in Swift because Swift is new and cool, so we want to explore it. Um, so we figured this is a very um, concealed part of the app. Um, so we completely wrote this in Swift, um, which is a good thing because all the code I'm showing today is originally or could be used uh, in, the, in the Watch app um, without any changes. Um, so today, first, I'm um, going to uh, talk about some uh, considerations we did before we started with the watch application. So um, what we 
um, thought is important to get right on the watch, what we can do with the watch and what we can't do with the watch. Um, then um, I'm going to talk about the, our concrete concept that we did and um, how we matched these um, pre-considerations to our um, application. Um, and then um, at the end, um, as it's called SwiftConf, and we want to do, have some Swift code here, um, I'm also talking a little bit very quickly about the implementation, um, uh, specifically about um, the changes between watchOS 1 and watchOS 2 for everybody that already has a watchOS 1 app, and also in general about how to communicate between the iPhone app and the um, watch extension um, uh, on watchOS 2. Um, so um, to start with the pre-considerations we had, um, so let's first start with the obvious. Um, a watch is about time, of course. Um, it's on your wrist, it tells the time, that's why it, uh, it's called a watch. Um, it has a very small display. Um, and it also is used at a glance. So the user is really um, raising his wrist, look at the time, uh, lowering his wrist. That's like five seconds of interaction. And um, you need to get the inf information uh, to the user in this very, very short amount of time. Um, so that's pretty much the obvious thing here. Um, but I'm going to talk about e each of these um, uh, points uh, in detail about, uh, and, and explain what this means or what this meant for us in the uh, watch application itself because of course the watch application you're doing probably isn't just telling the time. Um, so there are a couple of things you can do at the moment um, on watchOS 1 and also you will be able to do on watchOS 2. The first thing is notifications. Um, and as I said, it's about time. Um, I kind of try to sort these, um, the following points in order of time relevance. Um, so notifications is the one thing you can present in a watch and it's very important to know that um, all you do there is show the user something that's very important at the moment. You won't, don't want a user um, to get a notification like, hey, remember when you're going home, uh, do whatever, pick up the laundry or something. Um, that's nothing for a notification. Um, if you want to the user to be notified, notify him about now that you're home, do whatever. Um, also, complications are new in watchOS 2. Um, complications, for those who don't know, um, that's a term from the uh, traditional watch manufacturing. Um, and that's basically um, the all that is on a watch face that's not telling the time. So, for example, the current date is a complication on the watch face. Um, also, on the Apple Watch, if it tells you what's your current event um, from the calendar, that's a complication. Um, so, there is API in watchOS 2 um, now that you can also um, uh, use for, um, uh, for your apps and to get information to the user. And that's very essentially the one I was talking before, that's the one where you have five seconds probably, um, maybe even less, to tell the user what's going on on your app. Um, so um, that's where you want to show what's, what's currently happening on the moment. You don't want to inform the user about any future events, you just want to tell them that's what's going on at the exact, same, at the, at the exact moment when you're looking on your watch. Um, also, there are the glances. Glances are the, like when you, on the watch face, you swipe up, um, you see the glances. They are a little bit more about, um, they are also about what is happening now, but they, they have, you have the full screen to yourself, so they're, you're not competing with the current weather, um, the time, uh, the calendar. Um, you have the full screen for yourself, um, so, um, you can be a little bit more specific. For example, you could take, uh, tell the user to, uh, the current to-do item on your list is take out the garbage, uh, and also the upcoming one would be clean up the apartment or something like that. Um, however, glances are something the user needs to actively uh, open, so um, be aware that um, there might be things the user will not notice if you only put them in a glance. Um, 
And also, of course, there's the Watch app. That's a completely different thing. Um, the user has to actively open the app. Uh, there might be some sort of navigation, uh, navigational hierarchy um, where the user can navigate through different screens and, and um, these things. Um, so that, for example, in a to-do app would be the full list of all to-do items um, the user uh, added to your iPhone app or your watch app. Um, so on the last slide, I had this um, thing, these three points. The first one was a watch is about time. Um, I want to speak a little bit about what does actually mean for an app um, or what we think what this means for an app. Um, there always might be some um, edge case apps, like something very new and, and um, um, something that's never been done that might not probably fit into these categories, but I think for the general um, companion app to an iPhone, to an existing iPhone app, um, these will um, probably be helpful when um, doing a watch app. Um, so a watch is about time. This, this means it's obviously not only telling the time um, as it runs custom apps, but it means that the information you're um, showing to the user should be should have something to do with time, probably. It should be relevant now at this very moment. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, um, don't show the user something uh, like, hey, when you are at place X, Y, Z, then do the following thing. Um, instead, say to the user, hey, I now, at, now at this time, at this, right, at this very moment, uh, that's the point where you should do the following thing, or now there are uh, important things for you. Um, so, for example, in our hotel booking app, we, of course, show the current booking. We don't tell him, hey, in three months you need to be in Cologne for this awesome uh, conference, but we tell him, today is the day where you're staying at the hotel uh, in Cologne, um, so be ready to be there before the reception closes to check in, something like this. Um, the, however, the, um, the range of what is relevant now might be different um, depending on your application. Um, for example, for a hotel reservation, um, now could mean today, um, like you're staying at this hotel today, so somewhere today you need to check in there. Um, for a conference, it might be this hour, so the current talk um, that's given, that's probably the definition of now for a conference. Um, also, um, um, always inform the user about the um, current or upcoming event, um, and the upcoming event, only show the upcoming event um, if there is no current event going on. Um, you can see this, for example, on, the, um, on, on Apple's calendar app on the watch, um, where as long as your current event is going on, even if it's in the last minute and, and all uh, almost finish, finished, they are still showing this information to you because when you raise your wrist, especially for a complication that, that makes a lot of, lot of sense, if you're raising your wrist, you want, to do, uh, you want to know, you see the current time, so you want to know what's currently going on. Um, and if the current event is over, then it's time to, show, to move to the next event and show this event to the user. Um, you might want to process uh, progress further in the timeline on a user's request, um, but probably not by default. Um, so um, with watchOS 2, there's this time traveling where the user um, can scroll through with the digital crown and move to the future. Um, and unless you're a stocks app, that probably makes sense to you because you already know what's happening in the future um, for a lot of uh, applications. But that's always something that is, um, that's a request that is started by the user. Um, all the Apple applications um, are actually never uh, moving to the future because I don't care what's going on now. Uh, I know it's better for the user to give him the information what's going on in two weeks or something. Um, so all the, especially the notification, the glance, and the complications uh, are things that should actually only show um, what's in the future if the user really requested to do so. Um, so also keep in mind, um, this is all about information at a glance. Um, 
So when I say that, I don't mean the glance you're actually opening, but it's really a thing where you quickly look at something. So try to make the information as condensed as possible and um, as, um, as relevant to the current event as possible. So the second point um, I mentioned earlier was it has a very small display. Um, and this is really something that's hard for um, a lot of applications out there I've seen on the App Store. Um, you really have to show the most important information. Um, so you really, when you're uh, doing the conceptual work of a watch application, you really need to focus on what is the most important part of information that I want to show to the user. What's, what's the most important part of my application? And if you're coming probably from the web and now you're doing an iOS application, you already have done so um, probably because um, it was all about focusing and putting the most important stuff from the website on the iPhone application. But now this is basically starting all over again and we're trying to find even more important information and put them on the watch. Um, so it's really about focusing. Um, and if you're in your application, you do have the complete screen or even multiple screens um, that you can freely uh, add information to. But um, it's especially important if you are, for example, on a glance that you only have one screen or uh, even more important if you are at a compli uh, complication where you may have uh, three lines of text. That's like the biggest uh, compilation, uh, complication you, you can have. But um, usually you just have like half a line uh, on your uh, on the small display that you can fill up so it's really about focusing on the very important part of your application um, and also do as little user interaction as possible um, is what we think is really the key to a good watch um, application it's about consuming information not about providing information from a user's perspective. The user wants to consume the information uh, on the display. The user does not want to move through uh, 10 levels of navigation, uh, navigation hierarchy and uh, probably even have to make text input of some sort. Um, that's, that's really something that should be done as, l as little as possible. You, you don't want to have the user to um, for example, book a complete hotel on the watch. Um, there are applications that do this. We strongly believe that that's not the right way to do because there's so much stuff you have to do when, for example, booking um, a hotel. You have to put in your first name, last name, email address, phone number. Um, even if you're already locked in with an account, you still have to select the hotel, probably see a couple of pictures uh, of the hotel if, to, to ensure that you get this right, the right hotel, the one you want. Uh, probably check the map where it is located. And for all this, you need to interact with it. And even if it's a small device on your wrist, and basically all the weight you're carrying is your wrist itself, um, if you do this for five minutes, it's really getting heavy. Um, so you want to be quick there, and this basically means as little user interaction as possible. Um, there might be exceptions, for example, if you add a, have a to-do list and you add a single item, um, that's something that can be done very quickly with Siri. Um, uh, so just these small kind of things might be okay, but don't make um, the mistake to put all your available content on the iPhone on this very small screen and also have all the user interaction you have on the iPhone um, on this very small screen. And in fact, there isn't really a reason to do so because Handoff really is your friend here. Um, the watch is very great at doing a handoff between the watch and your iPhone. Um, so as long as you already have handoff between um, different parts, or different iPhones in your app, or between your iPhone and a web application, for example, this is probably something you can put into your watch application in like five minutes or so. Um, also, if you already have, have some support for um, any kind of deep linking um, so that your marketing team can sound, send out emails and they opening a, con uh, a screen of your iOS application. You have something very similar that, than what Apple is doing with handoff, so you're also very quick to implement this and it's very worth it. Um, there's no need to put the user through all the hassle to um, book a complete ho hotel on the watch if all he needs to do is 
take out his phone, have your little icon on the left screen, you swipe this up, and immediately um, the user can start where he stopped at the watch and start booking the hotel. Um, so definitely think about uh, adding handoff to your iOS application. Um, the last uh, point I mentioned was it is used at a, uh, at a glance. Um, so again, as I uh, already mentioned, the user only looks to, uh, on, the, on the device for a couple of seconds. Um, I don't think there are actually current um, numbers from Apple how long a typical interaction um, should be. Um, but Google is telling their developers something about, uh, I think, 10 to 15 seconds for a typical watch interaction. Um, and so that's what we really try to achieve here, to be that quick with our watch application. Um, and I think it's a very good number, actually. If you, for those that already have a watch, if you um, think about how much you're um, interacting with it, that's probably a very good number, like 10 seconds. You need probably three to four seconds to launch the application and then there's like five seconds or something left to do whatever you want to do on the watch and you're not like sitting there for hours and watching at the uh, stuff on your watch. Um, yeah, as I already mentioned, um, it's about consuming information. Um, so don't uh, do as little touch interaction as possible. Um, a good thing about, um, uh, or a good thing for um, dividing the touch interactions into the one that are good at the watch and the one that are not so good on the watch is probably um, state changes are very g great at the watch, like mark an already present to-do item as completed. That's one single touch, you just tap, tap the, uh, the, the task uh, you did and that's all there is. Um, Creating complete new content with Siri, like writing a complete email, probably not the good, so good. And even though it's possible on watchOS 2 to answer an email um, on the watch, um, there probably was a good reason why Apple didn't do this on um, watchOS 1. And that's probably something, some of the mistakes uh, we've um, heard before that Apple just thinks they have to do because um, the, the user requested this because nobody really understands why they can answer an iMessage but not a mail. Um, but still answering complete email on the watch is crazy. You always want to take your phone out for that. Um, yeah, so the next thing um, I'm going to talk about is how we, after we figured that this is what we understand how the watch app should work, um, we then try to map this to our um, iOS application and uh, try to figure out what the watch application should look like then. Um, so we had a couple of questions we asked ourselves. Um, the first was, what is the most important feature of the iOS application? And even though the answer to this um, turns out to be exactly what we don't want to do, um, it's probably a good question to ask for most people. Um, for us, the answer to this was booking a hotel. Um, that's the most important thing for the iOS app. That's, that's the reason why we have an iOS app um, at all. Um, but as I mentioned before, that's probably exactly not what you want to do um, on your watch because um, a lot of other points I mentioned uh, speaking against it, like the, all the user interaction. Um, even though I think if you're considering doing a watch app, um, this still might be a very good question to ask you. Uh, ask yourself um, to figure out what to do on the watch. Um, there are also other questions that were more helpful for us. Um, the one was, the, the next one was, what is the most time uh, relevant uh, feature? Um, again, the watch should be about time. So we were thinking, what do we have in our application that changes over time um, or where it, the user needs to do something at a specific time? Um, and um, that's clearly, when is my next reservation for us? Um, so the user needs to know, today I need to check in at hotel XYZ. Um, that's the thing that's the most time relevant for us. Um, the next question, or the last question we asked ourselves is, what is the most important information while on the go? Um, 
So that's the typical use case. If you're at home, it's not um, so uncomfortable if you're sitting at a couch to take out your iPad or your iPhone uh, and look, look up something. But if you're running through the city, um, taking out the iPhone, holding it in front of your face, and probably running into something, um, that's, that's not, not a cool thing. So it's probably better to just look at your wrist. Um, so while on the go, we figured, um, where is my next reservation is probably the right um, answer for our use case. Um, so that's basically the same thing. It's about reservations and upcoming reservations. The, one is, uh, the first one is asking when, and the second is asking where. So that's pretty <coughs> similar. Um, and so we think that's what we wanted to go for our watch application. We wanted to create a companion app that tells you when is your next reservation and where is it. Um, that's all we wanted to do. Um, we strongly see the watch as a companion device um, and not as a complete standalone uh, thing. Um, so, um, yeah, to wrap this up, we want to show uh, the upcoming bookings, um, show the location re relevant information for the booking, and show the time relevant information for the booking. Um, so we looked at our application and uh, asked ourselves, okay, what information do we need for a booking? Um, of course, that's what we're doing all day long. Um, so we had tons of uh, ideas what is relevant for a booking. Um, we uh, came up with uh, a first list about the up up uh, upcoming booking. Um, so this is basically answering when is uh, the booking, uh, the next booking happening and um, also a little bit where is it happening, but it's more like an overview of your bookings. So we figured the hotel name might, might be uh, interesting, um, the city might be interesting, the number of nights you're staying could be relevant to you, the arrival date could be relevant, the departure date could be relevant, and it could be relevant um, to know if this is your current booking, like the one that's going on now, or is it somewhere in the future because there maybe is no current booking and your next booking is in two weeks. Um, also, um, we then thought about what detailed information want we to give to the user to not only identify the booking, but also know, know um, where the booking is taking place. Um, so that is, for a hotel detail, the hotel address um, is uh, relevant to us. Um, the hotel on a map might be very helpful for the user to know where he's going. Um, the hotel phone number, because if he has some questions, he can call the hotel. Um, and also the earliest check-in time, the reception opening time, and the reception closing time, because if there's nobody at the hotel, there's no reason to go there. Um, and the reason why I'm showing this to you is because I think um, probably many people would run into the same issue. We look at this list and we are, was asking ourselves, how do we fit all this on a small screen that's already way too much stuff? Um, so um, this is where doing the watch application really becomes hard because you have to get rid of stuff that you actually think is useful there. Um, so we were asking ourselves how we can we make this easier or how we can, how do we display less information or less text but with the in same inf information density? Um, so what we ended up with was as the first thing, remove the departure date. If you have the arrival date and the number of nights, um, that's fairly easy to compute for everyone. Um, and also, uh, we think if you're staying at the hotel, you know how many light nights you have already been there. Uh, especially if you're at holidays, you probably don't know which date there is at, at the moment. So is it already Wednesday? Is it Tuesday? I don't know exactly. But I know I've been here for two nights. So um, if the overall number of nights is three, then I stay, I'm staying one more night, and then that's my departure date, whatever date it is. Um, and that's really, really the important information the user um, cares about here. Um, another thing is with the hotel phone number, um, it's pretty helpful to call the hotel if you have any questions, but calling on the watch, like in the train while you're on the go, Probably not what we want. Um, first off, with watchOS 1, there wasn't even a feature to call from, to, to place a call from the watch. Um, and second, 
if you most likely do the call on your phone, you take it out anyway. So there's no reason to present the phone number or any related information to this on the watch. But instead, it's much better to, again, implement handoff and let the user switch to the phone, um, hand off the hotel detail he's currently seeing to the phone, and then present him the fo phone number there and let him call from the phone, from the device that he actually wants to use for the call. Um, and the third thing is with the earliest check-in time, the reception opening time, and the reception closing time, um, actually the user should only care about one of these three things. And that changes over time, but what the user wants to, uh, has to care about is the next of these three events that are happening. Um, so if um, it's the day, for, for the user, it's the day where he, want, he needs to check in at the hotel, but um, the earliest check-in time, for example, is 3 p.m. Um, and it's um, maybe 11 a.m., then all the user cares about is that he needs to be, or he, he doesn't need to be at the hotel before 3 p.m. because he doesn't get a room anyway. Um, it's not free, so he has to wait till then. So this is the information in this case that we are showing to the user. Um, again, if the user then is, if it's past 3 p.m. Um, and the user hasn't checked in yet, the probably interesting information to the user is the reception closes at 6 p.m., so you need to check in by this time or you can only check in tomorrow again. Um, so in this case, the user doesn't care anymore about the earliest check-in time because we passed already uh, this point in time. Um, so we only present a reception closing time. And then if it's the day after the user checks in for a multiple day stay, then we, before the reception opens, show the user the reception opening time um, because um, there's no need to wake up at six, go down to the reception, ask a question, and then see there's nobody there to answer your question. Um, so in this case, um, we show the uh, reception opening time. Um, so that's hopefully a good example of how to condense your information on a small device, um, figuring out what's relevant at the exact same moment. Um, if you want to look up, again, if you want to look something up in the future, for example, if you're interested in when in general is the reception open, for example, on the weekend or something, it's totally fine to take out your iPhone and you might even be able to do a handoff to the iPhone app and then look it up there. But these browsing, browsing for stuff, that's something that the user can do very efficient on uh, his phone. Um, so just to give a quick overview about what it looks like then, um, to have a picture in your mind maybe um, very quickly. Um, this is the applica uh, application's uh, overview screen. Um, it's very, very condensed. Um, we didn't want to overload this with all the fancy UI um, uh, with, with like animations and all this kind of stuff. We really wanted to focus on the information. So um, what we're showing there is um, if there's this red bar on the left, that's your current booking that's taking place at the very moment. Also, the green dot being, uh, uh, next to the date shows you that um, check-in is already open. Um, and also, we, sh we show you everything you need to probably identify the booking. If you're a business traveler and you're staying um, five out of seven nights a week in a hotel, um, what you probably need is not only the hotel name and the date, but also which city you are currently in. Um, it's, for most tourists, that's not the problem, but for a lot of business people, it's really a question of what city do I need to be in um, this night. Um, so that's a very good info information to identify the booking. Um, and also the number of nights um, the user is staying. Um, if you then tap on one of these bookings, um, we are showing you um, a detailed screenshot, uh, a detailed uh, view of the map and also of the address, because the address is probably, if you're at the uh, central station, you take a cab, that's what you're t uh, telling your taxi driver. That you're telling him, I need to go to the Savoy, and it's in uh, Torino Straße 9. Um, so um, 
there's all this information you need to know to go to the hotel. Um, and if you're familiar with the city, um, also the map might be helpful to you. Um, of course, you're, if you're going by foot, you can also tap the map and then let you route to the, um, to the hotel. Um, so the routing part is done with the map as well. Um, and you can then swipe to the right um, and also see um, what I talked about earlier, the check-in times. Um, so for this uh, example here, the check-in is already open. Um, we're showing this user with the green arrow. Um, and it is closing at 6 um, p.m. So that's all the information the user needs. Um, I can check in now, um, and I can check in until 6 p.m. when the reception is closed, or uh, in our case, maybe the re uh, reservation um, is automatically canceled um, because we have this op option to freely cancel the re reservation. Um, so the user needs to know that he needs to be at the hotel um, until uh, 6 p.m. Um, so yeah. And that's what we, what we did. Um, now let's talk uh, very quickly about the, our, our implementation, um, or not that much about our implementation in general, but more about the communication between the watch extension and the watch app. Um, to, for a quick overview, um, just for everybody who hasn't done anything with the watch um, SDK, um, there are three parts involved in doing a watch application. The watch app, um, that's the thing that's running as of uh, watchOS 1, that's the thing, the only thing that's really running on your watch, and it's just containing storyboards. Um, so there's only UI there, there's no logic. Um, the second thing is the watch extension, that's running all your code and your business logic, um, and it is running on the phone, um, so you always need to asynchronously communicate with your watch if you want to simply change the text of a single label. Um, and of course, there's also your host application, the, your main iOS application that is shipping the watch extension. Um, so most of the time we're talking about the watch application, we are actually talking about the watch extension because this is where we do all our code. Um, um, and a couple of things to notice here, if you, and I really can't say you should, but if you're going to support watchOS 1 anyways, um, keep in mind that your watch extension cannot communicate to the watch app if your phone isn't in reach. So there's no way to have a custom, hey, you need to get in reach with your phone to be able to fetch data screen. You can't do this because to do this, your phone would be, has to be in reach to inform the UI that the UI should display this screen. So um, there's no way to do this. That's um, something a lot of people didn't understand at the beginning um, and were, yeah, didn't understand that they have to rely on the Apple UI in this case. Um, luckily, with watchOS 2, Apple saw this problem too and they switched this over. Um, now the watch extension is running on the watch uh, itself, so it can communicate with the um, uh, with the watch app and do this kind of things. Um, uh, it also is able to, um, to create or to fetch data um, from a known Wi-Fi um, without the phone in reach. Um, however, you might be careful when to do this because the watch extension is not able still to do any background execution. There is no multitasking on the watch. So if the user lowers his wrist, as soon as the display is off, your watch app is, your watch extension is um, uh, sent to the background and you can't execute any networking requests. Um, so be careful to do all your requests on the extension. You still probably want to do all the network requests on the iOS um, application. Um, so again, the watch extension, that's where all your uh, business logic um, uh, is living in uh, and also probably the control flow of your app. Um, and the um, iOS application only um, should be, uh, is, is used for long-running tasks, um, for example, network operations. Um, again, it can be done differently on watchOS 2, but be very careful if you consider doing your network requests on the watch um, itself. Um, um, so one of the uh, impacts this layout has is that your UI and your data always communicate asyn asynchronously with your uh, watch and your iOS application. 
So it doesn't matter actually if the watch extension is on your um, phone or on the watch. It's always done asynchronously uh, in both directions. It is a little bit faster now to communicate from the watch extension to your, uh, to your watch app um, because it doesn't have to go through um, Bluetooth all the time, but it's still an asynchronous to uh, thing that's going through an XPC service. Um, and as mentioned, um, the extension has no background execution, so um, do your heavy work on the iOS application in the background and then shift it over to the extension. Um, and also, FYI, um, the extension and the iOS app have different sandboxes, so you can't communicate directly. You need to use the frameworks provided by Apple. Um, so um, on watchOS 1, uh, what happened was if you want to exchange data, a good place to start was what we used actually were app groups. Um, so um, app groups are these containers of data that, um, um, that you can access from different applications, um, for example, as long as you're on the same device. So the watch application uh, that's running the actual UI has its own app group on the watch. Um, which you didn't use because you weren't executing code there anyway, but the watch extension and your iOS application had uh, an app group. Um, so you could easily use the iOS application to store data into the app group and then um, read the app group's data on the watch extension and then shift over um, the stuff to the watch app uh, on the device. Um, this is where Apple basically screwed every, everybody that's already having a watchOS 1 application in the store because what they did now with this uh, shift is um, now the watch extension and the watch app have an app group um, which is of no use for you because still your watch app doesn't run code. But um, the app group you actually try to use there um, is now only accessible by the iOS application. Um, and uh, so you can't do this trick anymore um, if you want to, if you already have a watchOS 1 app that basically does this, um, if you're going to move it over to watchOS 2, um, be aware that you can't use app groups anymore. Um, what they did is they introduced the watch connectivity framework. Um, there are a couple of methods. Um, Swift is so beautiful and so readable. Um, the first um, one is update application context. That's something you can use on both sides, either the extension or the iOS application. Um, that's used to update the whole context. You can't do delta updates. Um, what it does is it sends over, for example, a message from your phone to the watch extension. But as the watch extension does not have uh, background uh, uh, execution time, uh, the message is delivered as soon as the user starts the watch application. Um, so be aware only the last method of this is um, dispatched to the actual watch application. So don't do delta updates with this, but instead always um, do a complete data set. Um, the callback you're getting is the one of the, the third one, the one in the um, last gray block. It's the um, session did receive application context. Um, and if you want to communicate while both apps are running, um, you probably want to use send message reply handler, error handler. Um, uh, that's the one that gives you the callback on the last one. So if you call send message reply handler, error handler on the um, iOS application, you get a callback. Uh, session did receive message reply handler on the um, uh, watch extension, and then you can execute something, calculate stuff, and call the replay handler and get back to the iOS application with this thing, uh, the data you have calculated. And that's also um, valid vice versa. So you can call send message replay handler error handler on uh, the watch extension to ask the iOS application for the data you're actually needing. Um, so that's basically what you want to do for like network operations on the watch. Um, yeah, um, so that's basically all to cover today. Um, let's sum this up. Um, be aware that you, or try to only show time relevant information. Uh, it works very well for us. Um, uh, also remember that there might be information that's important on the go, um, and that's also a very strong use case for the, um, for the watch. Um, keep the information very condensed because of the small display. Um, 
do as little user interaction as possible when we are talking about um, creating content. Um, it's okay to do simple uh, state changes, but don't create content. Let the user create content on the watch. Um, ensure the UI is uh, understandable at a glance. Um, so don't do all this fancy UI stuff where the user first needs to figure out or wait for animation to finish and then figure out where its data is. But really relying on a table here is very helpful because the user really knows how to handle a table and where to look for the information. Um, and also, Keep information, uh, keep communication between the iOS application and the watch application at a minimum because it's always running through Bluetooth. Um, in some conditions, it's running over Wi-Fi, but still, um, you have to expect the worst case, which would be Bluetooth, and it's very slow. Um, so try to do as little communication as possible. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, you're also going to get a big cup, also, by the way, because you asked me for having this big one. Yeah, I only have the small one. Because last one, last year yeah. you had the, only the, the small it's one. It's very hard, actually, to uh, get a focus point on the iPhone with the cup on the complete display. So with the small You have to be very close with <laughs> the small cup, so yeah. I need a bigger cup. Well, <laughs> that's why we had the even bigger cups from uh, 7P this year. <laughs> um, all right, um, any questions? Otherwise, I have a quick one, because then we have to make a break. OK, go ahead. So yeah, actually, the first question is not directly for you, but I'm just interested to know who has an Apple Watch app in the store or will be in the store before uh, OS 2 comes out? One, Show two. of hands. Three, four. OK. Three, four. It's not completely true. It's almost there, but uh, <laughs> the last one. Um, and yeah. then I had a more technical question. Uh, how? Uh, I don't know if you needed to do that. Um, but, um, how did you, from the watch extension, inform your iPhone app that something happened? Uh, how do I inform from my iOS app to the watch extension? Or no, the other way around. The other way around. From the, um, we actually don't need to do this at the moment because we are just consuming the information that is done, um, that is uh, created by the iOS application. Um, but the methods I mentioned here for watchOS 2, they are working in both directions. So it's, you can send this. And also on watchOS 1, there is, um, I think, on the WK interface controller, there is a method that you can use to um, On watchOS 1, there is an, uh, a method on WK interface controller you can use to um, to trigger something in your um, main app, and it's basically calling a delegate uh, method on your app delegate, um, and it really is the same pattern then with the watch connectivity. You get a replay handler um, that you can execute to send the information back to the watch uh, if you're doing something, um, and that's how, well, we use it at one point when we, when we force reload the data on the watch. So then we are reaching out to the iOS application, um, telling the iOS application to re-download all the existing bookings for the user um, and then hand the application back um, simply a JSON dictionary with all the um, booking data. Okay. Cool. Somebody has a question? Otherwise, I would say we'll make a... Oh, you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah. It's on. I think it's on. It's on. Just speak in it. Uh, how do you recognize that... Um, Is it on? Wait a minute. How do you recognize... Or how does the iOS app recognize or the watch recognize that the uh, information has been recognized by the user? Do you show it just once or do you show it twice? Or do we have a time window? How long do you show it? Yeah, we basically uh, are very uh, really time related. Um, so we don't need to know when it has been recognized by the user, actually, um, as long as well, the, the time relevant information we're displaying here is the thing with the check in. And as long as the point in time hasn't been reached where we switch to the other display, we're constantly showing him that, showing the user that he has to check in um, before 6 p.m. today, for example. And then at 6 p.m., we switch over to, um, okay, reception is closed now, um, reception opens again the next day at 6 in the morning or something like that. 
Uh, do you think it uh, makes sense to measure the time, uh, how often it was shown, how long it was shown? For, for example, uh, you want to show it just three times. When you have three times, user look to his watch, you say, okay, now after three times it has to be recognized. So that might, I don't know if it's a good thing to do so. Um, that's probably a use case for the one of the comp uh, complications, uh, if you're doing complication support. Um, but still, you are not able to tell which task the user tried to accomplish. Um, so if you have like the, the watch phase with the digital numbers, there's so many complications there. So it can easily be that the user um, raises his wrist like 10 times and was watching to the weather, for his calendar, for the current time, and probably the current time is the most uh, reasonable uh, use case there. Um, so I think you really should show the information until the information is no longer relevant um, based on the time. And that's also what's going on with the time travel wh while you're spinning the digital crown. That's actually the trigger there. If it's not no longer time relevant, um, the next information is coming up. Um, you have so another one? Sorry. Quickly. Just one last question. Quickly. <laughs> um, do you, uh, how long is a um, watch app now um, available and uh, how many percent uh, of the users using it? Um, we did it on day one, so that was, uh, I don't know, what was it, uh, late April, I guess. Um, so when the App Store started with watch applications, uh, our app was there. Um, to be honest, as I mentioned before, it was very developer driven. Um, and we wanted to do something with a watch, so to be honest, we don't have any tracking in the watch application yet. Um, it's something we're trying to do like for the last four sprints, um, but didn't find the right time to do so. So to be honest, I can't tell you how many people are using it. Um, we don't have any tracking in there, um, but we do have questions from users uh, regarding the application, so there are uh, a fair number of users using it. I would argue that I like to hear from a company that they don't have any tracking. <laughs> um, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, but the goal is to have some tracking. Um, anyways, um, go uh, have a break uh, for like 10, 15 minutes, and there are still some food, and then come back here. We, when we come back, we will have a blitz talk uh, from Christoph and just after the talk from Marcel. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you, Michael. A round of applause for him.